the uh, Audio Kinetic webinar. I am Guy Whitmore, and I have a few fun things to talk about regarding adaptive music, dynamic music, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, and this in front of you is just a little quick overview of what we're going to try to chat about today. Um, and one thing I want to point out is obviously you can ask questions as you go. Those questions will come my way. I will answer them as we go so that this is a little less formal, a little more participatory amongst all our parts so that discussions can go this way and that depending on what your interests are uh, for tuning in. Um, but uh, as people start filtering in, I'm going to give you a little bit of a studio tour. You can see I've been putting together my new space here, um, Foxface Rabbit Fish Headquarters, as it, as it is. And there's more work to be done, as you'll see. I'm going to switch over to um, this camera here and give you a little tour. So uh, let's see if I can do this in front of you. You see my main monitor. I will back up uh, and system. And there's two monitors that I'm using are touch monitors. I'll demo those a little bit more in a little bit. And behind, I got my left, right, center, plus my little speakers and uh, acoustic treatment going in this way. Um, this is going to be an Atmos room, so you'll see the overhead speakers there and there. This is looking backwards. You can see all the work I have yet to do. Of course, I got my guitar amp set up. Murphy, oh, this is my dog Murphy. He's the studio dog. He's being lazy today. There we go. What a boy. Um, a little tail wave there for you. Anyway, uh, this has been quite a work in progress. I, I plan on doing a, um, a follow-up sort of video blog about um, this studio and why I'm setting it up the way I'm setting it up. I'm going to get this reset up so that you can I can demo some other things. Okay, now this is a Surface Studio. Let me go back to here. There we are. And um, I, I got the Surface Studio because it's a touch and pen based interface. So I'm, I'm kind of rethinking the way I work and how I work. And it is an ongoing experiment. And I'm probably going to spend some time uh, uh, video blogging about that at some point. In, in detail, but I'll show you a little bit about how that works. We're going to talk about the blog I just wrote um, about music design and the business of music design, and I want to get into that a little bit. There's been some good online discussion, and I want to share that feedback I've been getting. Um, then we're going to talk about mixing music in three dimensions, not just as a, a predetermined uh, format, but in a real time. Uh, a format that can play out as either an HRTF or in ambi uh, Ambisonic or um, an Atmos or whatever system you have. And I'm, to demo that, I'm going to look at uh, a game, Alien Descent VR. I'm going to talk about that and its ambiences, because it has 3D ambiences uh, that work much the way I work with music. Um, we're going to talk about Peggle 2. I've talked about that a lot, but not about the real-time surround mixing. Uh, so I'm going to go into that a little bit. And then as a, a last treat, I'm going to talk about how I work with variable music. These are music systems that never play the same way twice. Um, and for that, I'm going to share a piece that uh, uh, has just been a pet project of mine that's been going on for years. And I keep playing with it and tweaking it. and um, so you get a, a sense of what I do uh, when I'm not being paid as well. Um, so with that, um, let's talk about this music design uh, thing we have going. All right, I have to click here. There we go. There. So I talked about in the blog that music design is the act of deciding where, when, and how music will play across any dynamic media experience. It's the spotting session. Um, so that's the verb aspect. The noun is the technical plan and roadmap for that. Uh, the feedback I've been getting has been really interesting. Um, some surprise like, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about music design as something that you start a project with that um, 
even before you write the first note of music, you're thinking about where things are going to play and how it's going to play. Um, just like you would look at a film or a television series before you started working uh, on themes, right? So that was kind of the central thrust of it. Uh, you know, it's interesting, an another aspect um, of it, I always kind of ride the line between um, critiquing what's going on in contemporary uh, game scoring, and I, and I try to ride a line between being openly critical, but also being encouraging. And I hope I, hope I hit that line okay. Sometimes I worry I'm, I'm too critical, but um, I, I feel like there are certain things I have to, to talk about, and there's a lot of uh, composers that aren't involved in this process. And I think that it's gonna be important for composers to be involved in music design uh, if we want better experiences in, in our games and in our dynamic media. So that's really the bottom line. So I'm trying to call that out and trying to encourage composers to, to do this more and to do this work that it's actually part of the compositional process, not something someone else does. Okay, but you can read the blog to find out more about that. Uh, I talked about I'm trying to get this, uh, I'm using the term music designer as something that sounds more creative. It's a designer role and you work with the game designer. So it's where you put your creative hat on and decide, what do I want here? How do I want it to sound? And then the technical stuff can happen. So that's why I'm pushing for this particular title to be used more broadly and to be accepted. Um, I'm gonna get more into demos here. I'm not gonna, you can read the blog to, to get into this more, but if there are questions, uh, or feedback you've, you know, thoughts you've had about the blog, share them at any time during the webinar and I can answer those as well. Um, but another major point I'm making is that if, if games were static in terms of their evolution and what we have today is what we're going to have, you know, maybe the evolution of dynamic music wouldn't be as important, but that's not the case. Um, and it's, games are growing beyond what we can call games and they're becoming experiences and dynamic stories and uh, people from all walks of the artistic world are getting involved and we're going to see some interesting things and I think our music is going to have to be adaptive and actually be able to reflect what these new storytellers uh, are trying to express. So there we are. All right, so now, let me go back to my first slide here. Let me go back to a little bit about how I'm playing with this. Um, I'm gonna go to my, this camera. I'm gonna go to Wise. I'm not gonna play anything yet, but it is kind of cool that now I can take a pen and click on something, and there it is. So. The nice thing is, it's just right here in front of me. It changes my ergonomics of how I work. And obviously, WISE and most programs aren't really designed for touch and pen. And there's a lot of, I think that'll take time for uh, both Microsoft, um, as well as all the individual companies who make software to kind of adapt these principles. Um, you can do right click by you know clicking on the side. Um, I can come over here and look at, let me go back to designer, and uh, double click obviously works well, and um, just hitting a play button is nice. So there we go, we got some ambient Xenos, and um, I find it just liberating to be able to, I'm also, you'll notice I'm at a standing desk, I can sit or stand, this desk goes up and down, um, and I also find that extremely liberating as well. I have two, two monitors and I can, right now the OBS um, uh, transmission is going on that one, but I can share windows across screens and, and that is also nice. Um, not everything works as you think it might and again that's just going to take time. So I'm going to come back and forth to this uh, as I pull up other sessions, but for my money even just being able to open up things and click on them and hit play 
with my own finger <laughs> is really nice. So right out of the gate, I'm, I'm happy with this. Now I can always quickly just go back up and say, what about typing? Well, I have this, you know, I have the screen I can bring up, um, but I can also very quickly go boom, and I have my keyboard and mouse right here because there are things in most programs that just simply aren't ready for prime time with, with uh, touch. So, so that's a little bit about that, and you'll see me working with that across uh, these demos here. Um, so next, I want to talk about this idea of music all around you. Let me go back to here. There we are. OK. So the idea is this. We, we, a, a lot of times when surround music gets put into games, or in, uh, into games in particular, um, a surround music track is mixed and then put in a multi-channel wave of some kind is put into into the game into wise or, or whatever engine you're using and that's great it sounds exactly the way you intended it but there's there are some drawbacks to it especially with dynamic scores and dynamic music um, so let me talk about that and then we're going to jump into um, why I do this so this is a brief talk I gave at um, uh, McGill University while I was up in Montreal at, at, at their research music research center called Kermit. And, um, but it hasn't been shared beyond that. And it applies to all the music I work on these days. So even though it's, I, can sh I can show this in Peggle 2, I also use the same ideas in uh, Alien Descent ambient system. Um, so, <laughs> this was a quote. Peggle 2 has the most aggressive surround mix of any next-gen game I've played. Polygon. Um, I'm not sure if they were being complimentary or just uh, having fun, but it really is an extreme uh, mix. But that's partly because it's a whimsical game and I could, I could, and an abstract game, and I could really play with that, and I had a lot of fun doing that. Um, and in order to do that, to do this approach that I'm talking about, a real-time uh, surround mix, you have to break your music into component parts, at, at the very least into stems, and uh, if not stems and phrases. Because the more it's broken down, the more flexible it can be. That's one of my, one of my core kind of tenets of adaptive music design, uh, is the more elemental your music, meaning the more it's broken down into its component parts, whether that's a wave file or set of stems or MIDI files in sample banks, whatever it takes, that's the basis of elemental music or real-time synthesis even more. So there are different degrees of the elemental uh, breaking down of your music and keeping it that way in the game engine. Um, so a lot, of, even in VR these days, there's a lot of talk about, well, I'm gonna bring my music in and I wanna take advantage of height and surround and all of this stuff, so I'm gonna you know, have pre-recorded ambisonics or do these first order, second order, third order. You, you know, there's different file formats that you can bring in and play them back. But there's problems with that. Number one, they're stuck in space. Whatever you've recorded, you can't change it in the game. It's There it is. Um, you could have head relation if you wanted, but it's still, it's also stuck in time. And you can't remix it, you can't move it. Now imagine, too, if you had uh, several layers of instruments that you wanted to play and, and use sort of a, a vertical layered approach to your music, um, what would you do? Would you have each track be, you know, full ambisonic recordings? I don't know. That might be impractical. So the more adaptive the music, the less tenable this kind of approach becomes. So the idea of doing your um, 3D mix in real time makes a lot more sense after that. So there it is. I recorded stems and phrases individually with a tight reverb in the recording studio, not a big open church reverb, that, so that that could come in later in real time. I did some pre-mastering just to get each track and channel sounding good. Um, and I applied the, the Wise Hall reverb in real time. I find it's, it's an excellent reverb. Um, and also, at, you know, I add output limiters on the master bus of WISE, 
because if you have all these individual tracks of music, um, much like you would in your linear DAW, you want kind of a mastering bus to take those tracks and make them sound like one mix as opposed to uh, a bunch of disparate uh, instruments playing all over the place. And you'll see what I'm going to, I'll show this surround panning that I've done uh, and some of these move in real time. So I keep my scoring flexibility, I can reuse content, individual EQ and balance, um, all of these are the benefits of doing it this way. So let me just jump in quickly, not starting with Pego 2, um, but starting with uh, Alien Descent. So here it is. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to back up. So I'm going to mix these topics up a little bit. OK. So the topics you know, I want to bring back in music design. So this Alien Descent VR project, it's not something you can download on Steam and play on your Vive. It's something you have to go to Orange County to play. It's a location-based experience where four players get together, you go in, there's steam and heat and wind and all kinds of exterior uh, elements to make you feel like you're really there. The elevator actually shakes, that kind of stuff. I won't go into, into that detail, but more importantly, um, regarding how I got the gig, and this goes back to my music design blog, is it wasn't a producer or a, you know, a designer or a programmer or executive that hired me. It was a composer that hired me composer who wrote the music, I didn't write the music for this uh, experience, but the composer who did, um, Stephen Cabot, called me up and said, hey, I've got this gig, I'm doing this music, uh, I, would, I would like some help getting things going and wise. There you go. So we set up a, a music design for his music to function within wise, but that led to me troubleshooting their uh, 3D sound and their HRTF setup and, um, with Oral 3D. So one thing led to another before I knew it. I was integrating all the sound effects and uh, mixing the game as well. So a one and a half, two week project turned into six or eight weeks um, and it was became a lot of fun. So so there's the, the business lesson in that is that knowing this stuff, composers also become a client. Um, so I'm going to go to events. Uh, another interesting thing here, if you look at these events, they're all just stages 1 through 27. It's kind of a linear experience that is dynamic and that you don't know how long each stage is going to last. These places, these stages existed already in the game and I just hung these events off them as a way to have to make it really easy for the developers. That's one key to working with external developers is how easy can I make it for them? I didn't want to give them a bunch of arbitrary events and say, here, plug these in. Um, there was some of that because we needed to. But first question is, what is the game already doing or what kinds of things is it already generating? And he told me about this stage approach. I said, well, let's just hang an event off each of those. And that became the basis for triggering most of the uh, general ambiences, uh, all the music triggers, um, and so forth. So. Uh, I'm going to start with this one, and you'll see most of these are a complex set of things that go on. It turns things on, it, it uh, posts other events, and so forth. So when I play this, you're going to get a sense of what it feels like after your ship has crashed on the planet. headphones on, you'll be hearing things panning, and perhaps, I don't know how this works, over, how well it will work over Twitch, uh, but this is an HRTF output, um, so you may actually hear things in 3D if you have headphones on. So, let me stop for a moment and describe what's going on here. There aren't any ambisonic recordings in this at all. It's all mono and stereo source recordings placed 
um, around the listener. Um, so if I come to here, um, you can see I have various uh, things going. I have a loop and these other one-offs going. And this is very standard, you, you know, type stuff. But you'll see I applied some of these ideas to music as well. Um, so I'm going to open up, I'm going to get this started. And as I open here, okay. Oops. There we are. So if you can see this, this is the 3D position editor for the thunder you're hearing. And this is set up so that every time a thunder uh, sound plays, which is randomized, um, it uses a different 3D panning, uh, real-time panner. So basically it's a path. Here goes one. And each of these points, it stops it when I click on this, so apparently, uh, has an X, Y, and a Z coordinate. So Z is finally a reality. I can have height and, and, and downward uh, directionality. So green, I'm starting, I'm keeping these above because it's thunder. Um, but it, it moves in real time very quickly, and then moves across this line. So from back, this particular one moves from back center to front left. And each of these does something slightly different, back right to front right. And you know, for me, the important thing was more that it's just kind of random, um, but has movement so that the thunder seems to just move across as each one goes. Let's see if I hit play. Oh yeah, good. Now it's just going to play this. So I've built in, um, as you can tell, uh, a bit of random amount of silence between each one, and that's, that's variable. Um, that's a trick I like to use uh, for ambience as well as music. And so I have that element, and then I also, let's see. Wind gusts, mid frequency. Um. So these pan around you as they go. Here, I can just play that. So you heard it kind of go like this around you. Again, there's a a uh, bit of silence between each one. Happen to choose the same path that time. And you can set these up to be random or in sequence. When you choose step, like it is here, um, let's see, I might have a better view. Let's see, there we go. You can see that a little bigger now. Um, When you choose step, it'll cue the next time a sound plays. And that's true of the music engine, too. Every time a new clip plays, a new uh, pan can be played as well. And then the other part to that is the low frequency gusts. And So I, I think about it in terms of frequency ranges. And that way, the low frequency gusts are um, you know, separate from the mids and don't necessarily follow them. And then they inter their randomness interplays with each other and creates a nice ambient experience. No big surround files needed. And for my money, I prefer this type of experience. I can tune these. Uh, to how I want, uh, you know, 
I might not have done in a, this much of an extreme had I been out of context and trying to create, um, you know, 3D recordings to put into WISE. Uh, but here I could go, oh yeah, I want to make that more extreme, I want to make it coming from above or below. Um, I can actually tweak this quite a bit. And the levels of each one as well. So I'm mixing in context and that is, for me, really, really key. Alright, so that's the big lesson there. Now I'm going to um, show the same concepts uh, in Peggle 2. Come back here. And open this guy. Um, so this particular uh, it, Aliens uh, uh, VR, Alien Descent VR, uh, went to, a, ultimately became an HRTF output. And one thing that I discovered uh, when re 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 resurrecting Peggle 2 was, and revisiting this session for the first time in a long time and, and updating it to 2017.2, um, I realized, oh, I could really, really easily add height to this, to this mix. I could create an Atmos mix of Peggle 2 without changing much of anything and just adding some height information to each music track. So let's look at that. Um, which then means I could output an HRTF signal so that over headphones it, you have a 3D mix of your music. So let's, let's break this open a little bit. So I use the old Norman character here as sort of a good example because he has some of the most extreme panning going on. So this is like the soundtrack playlist for it. So <laughs> So you'll notice that those little gears and sound effecty things are moving around a lot, um, even just with a stereo set of headphones on. Now they're actually, if you had a 7-1 system, you'd hear them kind of go around you. And so let's look at this. Um, for instance, even in this opening little thing, which only has two, two stems in it. Um, So let's look at uh, the positioning of these. So this doesn't need much. It's just center and up front. Um, super easy. But this chip sound that I've got going on actually starts behind you and pans to the front. So if you have a 7-1 system, you hear it behind you. <laughs> Now the nice thing about this is I'm not coding it in 7.1 or 5.1 or anything. It's pretty much, it's, I, I guess you call it non-denominational in terms of its format. It's, you're just placing it, giving it XYZ coordinates and then the output of the game decides and the, and the receiver of the end user decides how it would be played out. So you don't have to commit to 4.0 music or 5.1 music or what have you. You just set your XYZ coordinates and your you're golden for any format that comes along. Um, so here's one of the uh, segments, and it's kind of one of the intro segments, has a lot of the gears in it. And the sound. So let's take a look at, I'm going to go, oops, no, I don't want to do that. Go to one. And okay, good. So positioning. All right. There we are. So right now, each track, as I click on them, you'll see has its own panning going on. So this way, I know it's it's 
Instead of panning in my linear DAW, I'm using Ys to mix and pan the entire project. Um, it was a lot of work, but it also uh, gave me so much flexibility, and I didn't have to do as much work in the linear DAW. I just made sure each track sounded, sounded good coming out. Um, but here's an example. If I just solo this up, this track, this goes back and forth between these two second pans. Uh, likewise, let's see this guy. This one would go around your head um, because I can I basically design one motion that starts here. Actually, no, it starts on the green, goes this way, and I can you can actually set up how much time it spends on each of these paths as it goes around. Total time is four seconds, so one, two, three, four. Um, and this sound goes around you. And the nice thing is it's triggered just as this sound clip starts. So there you have it. Um, so when you put all this type of stuff together, you get... Um, you get something really interesting. And again, I can play with it in real time while the sound effects are going and go, oh, that got in the way of the sound effects. Let me move it over here and get it out of the way. Um, so it allows me to mix with sound design much, much better as well. Um, so with that, look at this. I could now take the same. This was published in, what, 2012, 2013, I believe, uh, before uh, the resurgence of VR and all that and Z coordinates. But now I could take this point and go, well, you know what? I'm going to start it at 0. This one I'm going to bump up to 20, or where, where, however, actually, no, something like. It, it is up to 100, I think. So anyway, slowly have it come up. You get the idea. I could have it climb above your head as it went and go up into the overheads. So now that is there, and with a simple update, we could have an Atmos mix of, of Peggle music. Um, I don't think that'll happen, but there it is. It's possible. Um, and now that I've worked this way, uh, it's how I'm definitely how I'm going to be working in the future, as if I can. So let me look at um, one of the more orchestral sections here and show you how in those sections. <laughs> You'll see, um, oops, there we are. I just used the 2D panner, which means I was just placing them. I didn't need, I didn't need any movement in the orchestra parts. I didn't want the violin flying around necessarily. Um, so I just placed the orchestra around in a semicircle. Um, as if it were an orchestra in front of you. And I could actually, that's how I mix things. I could say, you know, I'm a little less, a little further back, a little more proximity, a little more to the left. I could balance the, the spread of the orchestra right here in Ys uh, by just going up and down and changing the spread of each, of each uh, part. And it was usually only the sound effecty type things or a synth part that would have motion to it, literally, um, as an aesthetic. But I, if you look at any given, let's see, there we are. There's a big long one. So, so nothing too extreme, just flexibility. You also hear that real-time reverb, um, which when you're working with as many layers and tracks becomes kind of the glue to hold all this together. Um, again, it's just another factor in turning this into the mixing DAW as opposed to my linear DAW. All right, so that is that. Um, and now let's pull back to here. Um, actually, not that. There you go. Okay. 
So uh, the next thing I want to chat about is variable music and how I work with variable music, how I always have, and some of the ideas and techniques um, and even concepts that go into it. The first and most important thing is variation isn't just variation. I think of it in terms of macro variation and micro variation. Um, macro would be this section of music goes to this section of music or this section of music. So you have in Wise I might use segments that go to different segments um, or a set of segments that could move randomly amongst each other. Uh, so you're working at variation on a phrase level. You could also bump that up and have whole sections of songs, uh, playlists for example, that move from one to another. Uh, and on the micro side, looking at any given instrument and putting variations to the oboe, variations to the violin, variations to the percussion, and those can be within the macro. Let me just show you. <laughs> Hearing is believing, and that's one of my biggest uh, uh, points I always make as well. So what I'm going to show next um, is a demo that I've been working on for a long, long time, off and on, lots of off, lots of on, and back and forth for a f more than a few years now. Um, and the idea behind this came from a, um, a concept uh, I've had in the back of my mind, well, more than in the back of my mind, for well, <laughs> 18 years, something like that. Um, I joined a company called Bootleg TV in about 1999 and was working on a, a project that basically was this. Imagine if the music you just listened to for its own sake never played the same way twice. So you would hear, your, hear a song and you go, oh, that's a, that's a cool song. And then you play it again but the arrangement is a little different. Maybe a little different, maybe, um, you know, maybe a lot different. So that depends on how it's authored. Um, I think we tend to think of, when we think of variable or generative music, we think of, oh, it creates a completely new piece of music. I'm actually more interested in how do I create an interesting piece of music and then have it vary enough to keep it interesting um, over several listens, many, many listens, and you discover new things the more times you listen to it. Um, and that's the concept behind uh, this Song of Koki uh, project. And the ultimate idea is, um, I hope at some point, it's been years, but uh, to have an iOS or Android release of this as a little player. Um, but uh, let me jump in and show you what I've got going so far. So you'll see I have this massive playlist and this is getting untenable. <laughs> should never make a playlist this long, ever. <laughs> I have ideas for how to get around this now. Um, but uh, so the idea is when I hit play over here it's gonna play one of the one version of this song and then when I press play again, it'll play a different version and a different version. Both macro and micro variations going on so that there are literally probably tens of thousands of possibilities, maybe more, I have no idea how to calculate that, um, of this one piece of music. And I've got even other versions of it. So let's hear a few first. Just I'm going to play a couple seconds and stop and play a few seconds and stop so you can hear how even starting off, the song is different each time you hear it. It takes a moment to, to load it up, so here it goes. This is why you don't have this many things in one playlist. Okay, now it goes. Okay, so 
that's one possible way this can begin. Let's try again. Here's another one. That gives you an idea of how um, there are very, very, very different uh, approaches or different uh, versions that can be made. Now, so let's dig in and see what's going on here. Um, first, just looking at this playlist, normally this wouldn't be sequence step, this would be random step. And what that would do is choose the next level down here and choose one of the sequences at this level going all the way down. And there's about five of those, so think or more than that, five or six or seven. Uh, think of that as the most macro. It selects one of those and then starts cascading down uh, that until it gets to its end. And some of them have randomness within that, and then within each segment there is further randomness. So you have increasing degrees, or from macro to micro, um, you're choosing a bunch of random steps. and uh, and that provides a lot of variation. It's also tricky to get it to each, each possibility to work out well. The, the goal isn't to have a bunch of completely random things. The, the goal is to have each outcome uh, sound interesting or, and good. So um, honing that in has been a big challenge. Um, let's look at some of the individual um, segments to begin with. Start micro and work our way out. So. Um, also, okay, here we go. So here's an example of one of the segments, and you'll see there's some variation here, and in this particular track, only with the acoustic guitar, and, uh, and you'll see that even just giving variation to the acoustic guitar changes how this particular segment comes across. Don't look away, look away, look away now. Don't look away, look away, look away now. This one chose no guitar. So I play it again. Let me just force this one. Don't look away, look away, look away now. Don't look away. So now we have a little guitar in the background. I've also been playing around with uh, stutter editing <laughs> in Wise, and you get an effect like this. Don't look away, look away, look away now. Don't look away, look away, look away now. So, uh, just doing that creates a lot. Now I'm trying to, I want to zoom in a little bit. There we go. So let me just show you a little bit about 
my experiments with editing and whys, because that might be interesting to people as well. Um, I took that same guitar track from above and literally just diced it on boundaries, on 16th boundaries, um, and to give it this effect. Um, once you get used to the movement and how to how these things can be edited, it's not so bad, but you have to get used to, it certainly isn't uh, Pro Tools or um, uh, or Nuendo by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but you can do some good basic editing, and even with the pen, I find I can do stretching and, and so forth, and dragging things around. I can give you that view real quick. Let's see, where is that view? Yeah, just go back to this. Um, so I can just pull things around with my finger back and forth, uh, drag and end, out and back. That's all pretty cool, but it does take a little bit of time. And then you have whether you want to lock it, snap it to um, bars and beats and all that stuff that comes in very handy as well. So there aren't a, a ton you can do, but there's a lot. And you'll see that I also use both the filter an awful lot, uh, just the built-in filter as well as built-in volume uh, that is also super easy to edit and touch. Those aspects work great in touch. Uh, moving sliders, not so much um, at this point, um, but, but I use, uh, use the pen and touch for what works well and, and use the mouse for what doesn't, um, and so far so good. So. And again, you have these little fades here too that I, I, I work with these a ton as well. Again, super easy to move these in and out. Uh, hold on, let's see if I have that. Is it five? Oops. There we go. There it is. That's the one. So there we go. Now we have an idea. Once you select, you can move things around. Uh, do all this editing. Right now my response is slow because I have all these things going. But you get the idea. Um, now moving on. Come back to one. And uh, let me dig into another segment or two. Here's one that has um, a lot of, a lot of tracks have variation, but sometimes only two different possibilities. Um, and because one thing I've found is um, when you have a segment and you're trying to make it sound cohesive every time it comes around, you can't have all the tracks having all kinds of variation. I mean, it's possible that it comes up with only one track playing at, at, at one point or just things clash. So in order to gain control of that, um, there are some things that are constant and other uh, other aspects, let me point, you know, notice these tracks are constant, whereas I have variation here, here, and here, and that allows it to kind of have a stability in terms of its form while having variation at the same time. Um, and if you read between the words, I almost say So if I can force different things um, to happen. Let's see, let me go back up here. Here's another one. Now one thing um, that would be nice, you can, here I've got a lot of uh, variation in the vocals, electric guitar, um, and I'm going to solo this and just show you what I have going on here. So using filters to fade things in differently, um, I can take the same loop and get a lot of different variations out of it and make different different sounds. Like this one has a does this and filters out. Whereas this one filters in.
and in context, let's see. So there you have it. Another thing that would make um, segments, it'd be easier to add more variations in segments if, for instance, I could, let's say I could synchronize this track's variations with this track so that if this variation played here, the uh, first variation would also play here. Um, a really good example is if you've got a, a drummer and a bass player playing together and you want them to, you want the individual tracks so you can mix them the way you want, but you want them to, the variations to synchronize so that when the drummer accents something, the bass player accents something. And then you can have a variation of those accents by having both players, um, uh, you know, sharing variation uh, track numbers. Um, as it is, if I want to do that, I have to copy and paste a segment and then do a variation, keeping the bass and drums the same, for example. Um, so. So you can see how any given segment has a good bit of variation even by itself, but it's still like a section, like this is the chorus, it's always the chorus, there's no... That only plays once in a while. So that will always be the chorus in that manner, it just has a little bit of variation to it. And then I pull out to the playlist level and start experimenting with what segments go well with and to and from other segments. And, uh, and that's what I'm doing right now is figuring out this is a linear cascade of them, but I want to be able to have more uh, randomness amongst these as well. Um, now, as you can see, this playlist is really, really long, but um, the drawback is playlists always play from the top. You can't, um, you can't play them, I can't select here and start playing from there. So it makes it challenging to play, oh, I want to play this seventh song version and play it from here. So what I'm going to do is break these out into different playlists. So these will be different, this will be one playlist. Um, so my recommendation is keep playlists to about, you know, at most, you know, 10 segments or so, and maybe two or three um, uh, groups deep, you know, with randomness with each one, for example. And that would make it more manageable. And what my plan is, is to then have these seven or eight playlists um, directed by a script in Unity, so that Unity can have some control. I think I'm just coming back to, I've run into the limits of what WISE can do from a logical, from a logic standpoint, and I have to write some of that logic um, using scripting uh, in Unity, and that's my next plan, so that I can kind of control things from a Unity script and trigger playlists um, or even specific segments if I want to. So that's kind of why I backed out um, from just trying to have WISE do everything and having the game engine doing a little bit of the higher level uh, logic above it. So that's a demo there. Um, and then you'll see I've broken, the, having all these elements here has also allowed me to um, uh, try completely different arrangements. Like that was similar to what the song was when I wrote it in, um, in my linear DAW. Um, and actually, there's I have a linear version that I kind of rebuilt here. Um, and it takes a while. Load, load, load. Um, and this is here we go. Now 
right, so I won't play the whole thing, but this particular one is one I crafted that is a linear version uh, of the song, and then um, I actually outputted it as a track, because I wanted to, like, okay, I'm going to focus on one and make use this as a way to generate a mix that I want to um, uh, release on its own as a linear mix. Um, and also allowed me to kind of hone in some of the mixing ideas as well, and then make variations from there. Um, also of note, as I was talking about, um, here's my busing system over here, and at the at this very top master bus, the Song of Koki master bus, I have uh, some effects going. I got the MCD, MCDSP uh, ML1, which basically acts as a nice limiter. Um, let's see if I can. It's not showing the meters. Um, I also have a, a high pass just to cut off low frequencies and a little bit of a mastering EQ and going into this. Again, to bring everything back into um, sounding like the song, all the tracks belong together as one, as one unit. So there you have it. That's basically my little pet project on the side. I, the thing is this could apply to any type of music. Um, I could take a string quartet and record multiple passages and phrases and create a nonlinear string quartet, for example. Um, using these methods, but it's not synthesized instruments. It would be live instruments. So that's another thing I wanted to prove is that um, you know music that has a has generative properties can sound uh, excellent and even have live recordings as a part of it. Um, long been one of my goals. Okay, so I'm going to flip back out to my thing here. So the, the question is, what if music didn't sound the same way twice, literally, not just I hear things differently or noticing different things? So with that, I want to open it up to broad questions, whether it's um, any of you out there, folks back at Audio Kinetic. Um, if there are further questions, I'm happy to talk about any of the things I demoed for you just now. Um, and it's almost been an hour already, so, but I'm willing to, to take questions as long as we have them. And if not, people can just hopefully watch this. This is being recorded, so people can watch this at their leisure. All right. It's a quiet, quiet audience out there today. So, well, with that, I do think we will close it down. And uh, hope you enjoyed this. And feel free to reach out to me. I'm at uh, um, Twitter, at Guy Whitmore, is the easiest way to get um, to watch what I'm doing. and and also www.guywhitmore.com. Check that out as well. And, uh, and have a good day. We'll talk soon. I'm still going. I didn't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. I didn't see these questions coming up. It wasn't scrolling. There are questions. Okay, I'm not going anywhere. I'm back. All right, let me go back to this. Um, there were questions going by and I just didn't see them. So here we go. Do you normally work with a specific programmer that's mainly uniquely responsible for the audio integration in game code? Um, and this is from Bruno Boselli. Uh, thank you for the question. Gosh, I'm glad I didn't sign off just yet. Um, no, I often work with a different programmer on every game. <laughs> uh, 
Now that wasn't true while I was at PopCap. Um, RJ Mattingly was our main scripter and programmer and created a really, really excellent core set of scripts uh, for Unity and WISE to work together. And we really, really benefited from that at that time. And I, I believe that um, RJ's work there is partly why we were able to make progress on a game and then take that progress and those learnings and take it to the next game. So that was that was great. Okay, there we go. So yes, um, uh, you know that was there is a benefit to working with the same programmer over time. As a freelancer, it's a new world. Um, with uh, Alien Descent, uh, I worked with a programmer that I've never met in person. I've never met this guy in person, but we we get, we hit it off really well. Slack was the main channel of communication. We just kept. Um, going back and forth and uh, it wasn't all business it was you know good small talk in there too just to kind of uh, make it more personal uh, and and we got things done there as well but you're correct it is much easier if you have a consistent line of uh, programming one of my longer term plans is to well first learn some scripting myself but to either whether I'm working with a scripter slash programmer that is a part of my business. That's one option I'm looking at um, in the future. But also to, to create some Unity and or uh, Unreal scripting that I can move from project to project with me and offer as a part of my service. You know, uh, If I create a solid bunch of scripts that can work with WISE, you know, to me that is power that I can bring to a developer and say, hey, I own these scripts, we'll modify them to work in your game and now we have all these this entire feature set that's ready to rock and roll. So that's something we all should think about and um, teaming up with our um, and with our colleague programmers. All right. And Dandy Faze, do you export the stems dry or with any effects? Okay, so back to um, um, the idea of the stems. They're not totally dry, like with Peggle Two, for example. Um, but the first but, but pretty tight. It's, there's the natural room reverb. And so we had close mics and we had mid distance and, and some overheads. Um, and it was a Studio X is a small enough room that it doesn't have a giant reverb to begin with. So we had mostly close and some of that room verb on there on purpose on each of the stems. And it's a quiet room, so we didn't have to worry about noise floor buildup. And that was nice. So um, anyway. That, that worked out great so that we could add the long reverb, the hall reverb in WISE. Um, so I don't think bringing it in totally dry, there's not enough real-time processing that you can do. So I just do the, what I think of as foundational processing, um, a little, little nudge of compression, a little mastering EQ on each stem, and leave that room on there, and then bring it in. It's almost like if you're doing a mix, whatever you have on the individual channel, maybe Anything that's not going to be uh, useful in real time, go ahead and bake into your stem. That's my general rule of thumb. Why make it real time if it's just going to take up CPU? So that's how I think about that. Uh, fail reload. Digging the modular music design, what's your process for exporting all those elements out of your DAW? Seems like a daunting task. Yes. Um, you know, this one reason I've experimented with a lot of different DAWs and um, yeah, I'm getting better and better at, at exporting individual stems and individual phrases how I want them. Um, and sometimes it is just I have to go stem by stem and phrase by phrase, but I'm getting better at being able to select the ones I want and just bouncing them out specifically either straight into uh, a fold export folder that I know I'm going to bring into WISE. Um, and so forth. What I would love to see in the long run, now imagine this, I'm going to come back here and bring this up. Imagine how cool it would be, and I know, see Steinberg's already got a great head start on export-import, and that's a good start. And the next step, oops, here we go, got to get my mouse back. The next step, here we go, would be to take a segment like this, what if I could export an entire session 
as a music segment. Not necessarily all the effects, because VST, whatever, but even just time-stamped clips from a session. This track would become a track in Nuendo. This track, Forest Grand, would become a track in Nuendo, etc., with these elements time-stamped uh, across that, so I could do editing there and bring them all back in. So in other words, I could bring in an entire session as a bunch of stems. So uh, that that would be an ultimate goal and would be uh, great for moving back and forth. Because yes, with this project, um, I, I did have to do a lot of going back and forth. Um, I've worked with Nuendo a lot, Pro Tools, Reaper. I've, 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 I'm familiar with all three of those very well. Um, and this was written in Pro Tools and, and exported in. It was really challenging to bring those back and forth, especially like, oh, I want to do a new vocal track. I go over to Pro Tools, record, blah, 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 bounce, 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 bring it in, line it up. So yes, the, the chain of pipe, the pipeline is, is not as smooth as it should be. That is a fact. Uh, but you learn tricks as you go about how to export and import really quickly. I've gotten very good at that. All right. Uh, let's see, Raga Sath, about your album, what kind of approach do you take when thinking about achieving the desired mix when playing through Wise? Um, for me, the desired mix is uh, how I would like a linear mix to sound. In fact, the holy grail would be, if I were making a linear mix in Nuendo, is this, would this be how I want the mix to sound? Um, and that's why I, you know, even with real-time reverb, I have the mastering step uh, as well, so that it's sounding like it would. In fact, um, uh, for this record, uh, I'll be bouncing out tracks that will end up, you know, probably on on Bandcamp or Spotify, etc., uh, out of Wise, because this is where I'm doing the final mixing is here in Wise. So I'm outputting things, um, uh, you know sometimes straight back into the linear DAW, and then I have a linear track. So I think if that's the gist of the question, the goal is, you know, and I always do a back-to-back -back comparison. Sometimes I'll have, I can have my linear DAW open at the same time as Wise, and I'm listening to what I have going there, and said, well, how do I make this better? And obviously, you know, I don't have all my VSTs here, so there's a processor um, plug-in limitation that I can't quite get. So then I just bake in certain things and bring them back over. Um, again, lengthier process, but the idea is that I maintain this flexibility. Um, but again, I'm always listening to mastered linear uh, tracks that I love. Like if there's a, a song that I love the mix of and the mastering of, I'll pull that up and kind of A-B and go, am I anywhere in the ballpark? And uh, kind of keep moving towards that, both those levels, that sound, the dynamic range, etc. And because uh, that's the ultimate goal. All right, there are more questions. Good, good. I'm glad I caught these. Oh my goodness. JP Melodic Magic, based on the song you've shown, have you thought of creating a real-time game VR interface for a live virtual concert hall? You know, yes. I it, every time I demo something like this, people say, oh, I could, what if you had an interface where you could change the music by moving or blah, blah, blah. And I think there's going to be space for that. In fact, there's people doing that in VR. Um, if you haven't played Res Infinite, um, then uh, uh, that, that's a, a good example. And there's others as well. But what I want to try to prove out with this example and others is that music can hold its own by itself, that we don't need a visual uh, or, or inter interactive component for this type of arranging to be um, enjoyable and have it be its own format. In other words, I'm trying to boil it back down to just the music as if you were just, you know, um, in your studio or in your car or on the subway listening and not interacting but getting a new experience. That's kind of the goal with this. Um, you could easily add game elements and say, yeah, when I'm in this mood, this changes to that, or when, I, when I'm walking, the tempo, all that kind of stuff. I, I definitely think a lot about how we, interactive elements could come into this, but I first want to establish 
the idea of yes this music as a variable set of of, of songs stands on its own and to me that has to happen first otherwise it feels it can feel like a gimmick and I've seen a lot of uh, attempts at this as far back as the you know late 90s that felt um, felt like games and you know they they were trying to be serious experiences but they were turned into little I don't know it it, it belittled the music in some cases um, and not that it can't work I think it can but I think it can also stand on its own so that's kind of my first goal and then I want to see what else can be worked into it as VR develops maybe there'll be you know very obvious things that will seem subtle enough um, maybe it's attached to your you know the, the monitor you have on your wrist that's monitoring your mood and your heart rate and everything else and those elements go in and subtly change the music based on how you're feeling I don't know um, it might be stuff like that um, but you have to have this foundation first before anything else uh, even will make sense or will sound good because this is it if the music doesn't work at this level it's not going to work as a, a component of an interactive game either so all right all right there we go and we have another one uh, Simon Schmidt so the sounds you showed in the beginning that were HRTF they were just stereo and mono files made HRTF by Wise Plugin yes so in the first example um, Aliens Descent all the samples themselves I should have zeroed in and showed you I could probably pull that up but the, the answer is yes in fact in every example I showed today um, the elemental wave files were mono or stereo clips brought into Wise and then spatialized with using uh, the WISE panner and either the 2D or the 3D panner and then going into either um, in the case of, of Alien Descent an ambisonic or Oro 13.1 uh, mix channel and that gets mixed down into the HRTF in that case with Oro 3D plugin and I know there's different ways there's a, actually quite a few plugins out there that can work that way that was just what they were already using so we went with it and it, it worked pretty well but yes um, you know when I think about using ambisonic recordings because people are recording a lot of like nature and ambient recordings and ambisonic um, and, and so forth to me those will work as beds but as a bed that doesn't have much if any movement in it at all I mean movement but not elements that you can single out once there's an element I can single out as like even even a single crickets and, and so forth I want those as samples so I can kind of place them and set the pacing of how they come and go um, certainly car drive by so if you get city ambience in, in uh, ambisonic I don't have control over when a car goes by or when a truck goes by it's just an ambient recording of a city with a car honks and stuff like that and then you, you, you start to notice those timings um, and so forth uh, so for my money I'll use ambisonic recordings a very almost like room tone as the room tone aspect of a mix um, and so forth and for music I can't see using ambisonic recordings or, or 3d recordings because I can construct all of that here I could so I could take theoretically I could take this last uh, song of Koki um, repan it in 3d uh, send it through an, uh, an ambisonic bus second or third level and then have that mixed down to a stereo HRTF output and uh, you could listen on your headphones and hear that in so it'd be a 3D mix that would not be the same way twice. So you can do that today in WISE if you hook that up uh, and, and get Unity as a front end or Unreal, what have you. Uh, it's right there. So yeah. All right. <laughs> I believe that is it for today's questions. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. I'm so glad I actually caught those questions. Hope you hung out to see me answer them. Uh, so it did turn into me 
collecting all the questions at the end and then going through it. Turns out that was easier anyway. Um, so hope you enjoyed everything. Feel free to reach out on Twitter or if you, if you know me on other social medias, that would be cool too. Um, at, at Guy Whitmore on Twitter. And I'm happy to answer questions and because um, I love sharing because the more we share, the more the community builds up, the more interesting music that happens, the more features we'll get in our, in our software and the more our clients will ask for what we do. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye for now.